what we saw in the Supreme Court is an absolute clash of two notions of law. The judges, and it's truly astonishing, and I've been amazed that the rest of the legal profession has largely remained silent. Um, the judges did not cite a single relevant precedent in the judgment of the Supreme Court. Uh, they cited, of course, what they did. Uh, I know what they're like. I used to mark people like that when I was at Cambridge. They are glib to ones who think they're firsts. And they cited, you know, the first lady hair. You know, going back to... The one with uh, the spider. Uh, the one with the spider and the kind of vicious little face. Um, how of them. Um, she began by citing the precedent of, of Sir Edward Cook, uh, Lord Chief Justice Cook, um, in, in 1611 um, about uh, in the case of proclamations about the fact that all, uh, uh, all um, uh, acts of the prerogative are subject to law. Yeah, but he's talking about acts of the prerogative, not in terms of high policy, he's talking about them when they impinge on the subject. It's completely but, irrelevant. But do you know what? In the, in the infinitely proper judgment of the High Court, of which remember, the people who were overruled in the judgment of the Supreme Court were, let's list them, the Lord Chief Justice, the Master of the Rolls, that's the head of Chancery, and the President of the uh, Queen's Bench Division, the three most senior practicing judges in England. And if you read their judgment, it's a proper legal judgment. Mm. It looks at precedent. It weighs carefully whether there is a separate legal and a separate um, political sphere. And it comes up with all the proper answers. Mm. The judgment of the Supreme Court never replied to any of that. It, it's almost like saying it is... Because we it, say it is. It is because we say it is. But you see, what they're doing is, they are doing the opposite of English common law. Uh, they are applying, this is why, as I said, the judgment is so revolutionary and so dangerous. It is applying a series of abstract principles. And, but the most fundamental, so I think the judgment, right, let's get it really clear. It is wrong in law. Mm -hmm. And I know, and I've talked to a lot of serious lawyers. They are astonished by it. It is wrong in law. But the other thing, that makes it de doubly deplorable. It is wrong in fact. Article 55, paragraph 55 of their judgment, purports to offer a description of parliamentary sovereignty. It lays the claim that uh, MPs are directly elected, that they carry the voice of the electorate, and that the government is answerable to them. Do you know what it does? It ignores parties. It ignores manifestos. It ignores the absolutely demonstrable fact that no MP and you know, well, you've actually an interesting exception, that no MP actually, if they stand alone against their original party, wins the seat. And, and you were very, very rare in doing that. And, and in other words, it is, it is a politically illiterate picture. They also get the name of the party. Conservative Party chief whip wrong, which well, wasn't I mean, we, 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 but, but, but you go, you go on like this. But I mean, for me, the thing that's so deadly dangerous is they misunderstand parliamentary sovereignty. And do you know what they're turning? They are turning that House of Commons into a self-perpetuating oligarchy. That's what they're turning it into. Um, and anyway, I think that the, de the dangers are simply infinite. But we would then compound the danger if we said the solution to this is to have American confirmation hearings and reinforce, entrench this idea. Right. I think there are now three possible lines of development from where we are now. The most likely one is that our parliament turns into something like the Italian parliament, in which you never... Never help us. You, ne you never ever have a majority party. Uh, in other words, no party manifesto is worth the paper it's written on because all governments are formed by backstairs negotiation. They last for a year and, and they year last for a year. And, and moreover, we would do it much less well than the Italians because as the Italians have just shown this year, they have a president who is capable of acting as an arbiter. Now, I'm going to commit heresy. That is the proper role of the monarch. It's a role that is carried out in Spain by Juan Carlos. It's the role that's carried out in the Netherlands, in Denmark, by Thailand, Thailand. Uh, and and so on. Thailand, Thailand is rather different. Um, uh, 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 thank God our monarch is not a sacerdotal priest. But the Henry VIII wanted it, but thank God didn't get it. Um, uh, the, the, so, um, uh, but, but our monarch has refused to do that, and that means 
A, I don't think there's much point in having a monarchy, apart from the fact it's nice and ceremonial and makes me feel comfortable as a historian, and a bit expensive for that, uh, but it, it also means we've got no political arbitrator. Because, of course, the speaker, as who might have it, uh, occupied that role by his blatant partisanship, hasn't. So we might go down that route, which is, and we would, at that point, we would get proportional representation, and our parliament will be the kind of quarrelsome, contemptible object that the Italian parliament is. I think that's the most likely development. The second possibility is that you have, um, uh, and it's very unlikely in the present circumstances, in the next election, if we're ever allowed to have one, of course, as Parliament has made itself effectively self-perpetuating, um, uh, if we're ever allowed to have one, suppose by a miracle one party emerges with a clear majority. If they had any sense, they would then pass a series of pacts that would declare that every decision that Speaker Burko had made was repealed, they would repeal, they would abolish the Supreme Court, and they would abolish the Fixed Term Parliament Act. Yes. And at which point you would restore the old functioning constitution. And I would also do something about judicial review, actually. And, and I would agree with you about judicial review. Uh, as a spectator was saying today, you would have to have a parliamentary statute that limited judicial like review. Because ju judicial review is preposterous. I mean, nobody, as we saw with Gina Miller, nobody objects to a decision, the method by which a decision is reached, unless the object of the decision has been reached. So it is all, the pretense that it is just dealing with procedure is always false. And one final point, the, the other, the, so one outcome is a European style, another one, the best, would be a return to the traditional British style. The third, and it's one that I've always thought about, if the judges want to continue to have the role that they do, and they clearly love the idea, those preening people absolutely adore the idea. If Parliament wants to decide that it's separate from the government, because remember, the reason that our Parliament has worked is that there is no separation of powers. There is no fundamental distinction between the government and the Parliament. You know this. At least 100 MPs are part of the government, and they are the most intelligent, the most forceful, the most directed, the most purposeful. And the Parliament works because it's directed by the government. And when the Parliament isn't directed by the government, as in the last three years, you have chaos. Um, and you can agree on what not to do. Nobody can agree, actually, on what to do. But the other possible outcome is if you want to have a separation of powers, so you've got, which the judges seem to want us to do, uh, so you have a distinct executive, you have a distinct legislature, and you have a distinct judiciary. The only way you could make that work, and this is really incendiary, is by a directly elected prime minister. And then you, I, in other words, that we go down the American route. The Americans confronted, we were talking about the American Revolution, the Americans confronted this choice um, in, uh, in, in their extraordinary meetings in Philadelphia, uh, and particularly if you read, have you been familiar with the Federalist Papers? Yes. They're astonishing. They debate all of these questions about the difficulties of democracy, what forms of limitations you need on democracy, all of that kind of thing. They're all discussed there. And we, I think that in many ways I would prefer the outcome of, okay, let the judges play their games. Let a Burko-style parliament emerge, but then let us have a properly, directly elected prime minister. This, this bothers me. I mean, no one's more... Why? Well, I've been, throughout my time in politics, fiercely against a number of Tory party and prime ministers. Goodness knows, I think Osborne and May and uh, a whole bunch of them have their inadequacies. I don't think Mr Osborne was prime minister. Well, <laughs> Cameron. Cameron. Virtually, was Cameron. Cameron. He, he, he was what passed for Cameron's bread. In, in, in my, in my, in, in, in my fevered imagination, yeah. they often blended into one. Yeah. Yeah. But I, even however critical I am of British prime ministers, I look with horror at an electoral system like America where every generation you produce a Richard Nixon or a Lyndon Johnson. And I, 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 I dislike the idea of um, a, a sort of Peronist prime minister. And I think Parliament is a great filtration mechanism. It, it allows a lot of dunderheads to rise to the top, but it also it's keeps It's not up. showing itself very distinguished at the moment, is it? I mean, this filter seems to me to be allowing, and I think, I mean, if you look at the current cabinet, I would say it's 99% uh, dross, isn't it? 
Oh, and if you look, and if, yeah, that's right. but then, but then, if you look at the opposition bench, it's that one hundred percent draw. So, in other words, the, the filter mechanism isn't working. And you see, I think there's something else which is really important. But it's the if intake it, into the pump that's wrong. Well, of course it is, but that's a, that's not readily solvable. Um, the key point is, if you have a gen, if you have a prime minister who's subject to general election, we would never have to fear a problem. A call, you look at his ratings; he would never, ever become. Prime Minister. That's true, and, but at and, the moment to become Prime Minister, you become the leader of a party, you seize control of the party machinery, yes, that's right. the pendulum swings your way, bingo. Well, that is if you've got a majority. Yeah. If you don't, then the mechanism doesn't work. You see, what is really striking is our parliamentary machine, this again, the judges were just, I'm sorry, I hate to say this, they are pig ignorant. Um, our parliamentary system underwent a series of violent adaptations in the 19th century to accommodate it to democracy. You know, mm -hmm. Up to the middle of the 19th century, parliament was really an immensely effective. I mean, it was just what you described. It was a selection machine by which you filtered a highly talented, educated, driven, ambitious aristocracy, modelling themselves on Roman and ambition for world conquest, and of course doing the most shameful financial deals and everything else uh, as, 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 as they were doing it. And then, first hesitantly with the 1832 Reform Act, and then much more rapidly after the 1867 Act, which in which a conservative prime minister just please gives the vote to the working man between that and the uh, uh, 1884 act which gives gives the vote to virtually every man you get a different kind of parliament emerging in which mps are subject to the whip MPs are subject to party discipline. You create manifestos. The political parties become fixed. And at the same time, you get the development of Erskine May. And the whole point of, uh, of Erskine May is to bind the parliament to an agenda set by the government. You're, you're actually right. After 1884, you start to get this whip system. You no, it's before. Well, it's in 1884 where you get the creation of the first part, the, 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 the one MP system. You, you, the year they give the working man the vote, in 1884 is the year they adopt an electoral system where you get rid of multi-member seats. Oh yeah, I know that. So but but, but so the, 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 the development of the machinery in Parliament is earlier. Erskine May embraces the 1870s and the 1880s. I think Iolanthe, the wonderful Gilbert and Sullivan satire, is 1882. And you remember Private Willis's song, and every boy and every girl that's born into the world of life is either a little liberal or else a little conservative. And you know, MPs vote just as their whips tell them to. But the thought of, lo of a lot of dull MPs MPs in close proximity or thinking for themselves is what no man can bear with equanimity. He's par in other words, it, it's parodying a system which is already there. And what we forget is the system of whipping, the fact, bluntly, that most backbenchers have got no point. This desperate attempt at pretending backbenchers have something to do. They don't. But the whole attempt at professionalisation of being an MP uh, you know, is heaven, it, forbid. It, it, heaven forbid it produces, you know, Jared, whatever he's called, Jared O'Mara um, from, 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 from Sheffield Hallow. Um, uh, it, it is absolutely disastrous. 